You're listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and I'm joined today by Glenn McCall. Glenn is market president of First United Bank in Oklahoma City in Edmond and someone that I've known for almost 30 years, no, more than 30 years now. So this is a real pleasure to have you on today, Glenn. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, my friend. It's uh, I was thinking about this as we were talking about doing this and talking about a career pathing and all the things that go along with that, that yeah, it's been a long time. So I graduated in 88 and you graduated in 89, 89. So it was one year difference, but I don't think we were like the best of buds in high school. <laughs> we, 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 we weren't, uh, <laughs> we, we had a mutual friend. It was a close yes. friend of each of ours and he brought us together. I remember we spent That's right. one for me, it was a very memorable weekend. You may not even remember at Eckerd College when you were a freshman there, I'm, I'm sure. When I was a senior in high school, we went out and you were uh, gracious to, le to let me join in. And I just remember playing you know, beach volleyball on the on the water. I mean, what a great place to go to school. It, it was not bad. Um, you know, as I as I went to high school with you and, and Largo, we um, I had all my buddies, including our mutual friend that went off to big schools and uh, Florida State, of course, being that school. And, and for me, it was just, I needed something different and, uh, did pretty well academically in high school and was fortunate enough to really get a, a good scholarship, um, uh, uh, there at that at campus. And, and it was a school at that time, 1300 students. So wow. smaller than our high school, but yeah, that was a fun weekend. That was a fun, fun weekend. I, I imagine that was a fun you know, very different than, than FSU where I went, which, you, you know, you never get to know most people, let alone all of them. But um, it, when I was out there, the one memory I had was that it felt like a community. It felt like you guys were, were all buddies and I, I really liked it. And I've encouraged my kids and my older two to not go to a small school, even though I, I encouraged them to, because I, I've always remembered that weekend, which is kind of an interesting thing as it stood out. And I thought, well, that would be a really neat experience. You know, very different than, than what it, I had. It, it was neat. And, you know, it's, it's, um, I was thinking about this. I mean, you get in, in the school I went to, it was 20 students. I think it might've been 18 per professor. So, you know, imagine, and I think the average professor was a PhD, uh, you know, 75, 80% of them were PhDs. So it, there weren't places to hide, I would say in that environment. It was, it was, if you came to class and you, you weren't prepared, it was an un uncomfortable situation. You couldn't hide in the masses. So I would say that there was that that um, conversational element to my education that was pretty cool, um, without a doubt, without well, a doubt. So it was a great experience. Yeah, so you went to college and learned, which is very different than my experience. <laughs> yeah, um, so, you know, one of the things, it was a liberal arts college and uh, Eckerd College uh, was, and, and um, you know, but I, I took a class on German art and philosophy. Now, I don't know how often I'm using German art and philosophy, but there was a lesson I, I will never forget from, so you talk about learning. I, I uh, it was on Kierkegaard or something, right? Like it was like 23 pages I had to have read. And, and this particular class was literally held, held in an office and it had seven students in it. Wow. And, and so you're sitting there and, and he's like, and you go around the room and, and they say, well, Glenn, what do you, what do you think of the passage? And, you know, I hadn't read the passage. I was probably, that was probably the weekend you came down. And um, so I, I didn't read the passage and the professor said, oh, um, well, uh, okay. Why don't we take a minute here? I need to talk to the rest of the class. So I had to get up out of the, out of his office and he asked the rest of the class, can you, is it, is it okay if Glenn stays here? And it was like, and, and I came back in, they said, you know, we all voted to allow you to stay for this class. But they if didn't you're not vote you there, off the island. They didn't vote me off the island. But, <laughs> they but I'll tell up. you, it was like, it, it taught me a lot about being prepared for meetings or interactions, like from that moment forward. And they said, hey, if it happens again, you're not going to be able to stay because the, the totality of this of this experience is based on your contribution, whether it's erroneous or all over the place, we need to hear different, you know, worldviews, so on and so forth. And you bringing nothing to the table is not, not good. So I, uh, I took that to heart. That was something I really learned in that experience. So. Wow. I mean, it, it, yeah, there's so much, we, we could talk probably for 
Yes, we can. straight about that lesson alone and, and how that compares to lessons that kids of similar ages are learning right now in the world or not learning, yes. I think, more, more appropriately way to phrase it. Um, right. uh, and, and, you know, but what I find interesting is that it, it just resonates you know, with, with, as a parent, as, as someone, you know, like you, we have kids in school right now. So how do you impart those kind of ideals to, to your kids? I mean, how, how important is teaching those lessons? Because, you know, just, just a quick, you know, yeah. to back up a minute with our, with our history. So everyone knows we didn't talk or interact in any way for 25 plus years. Um, yep. I guess Facebook probably is how we reconnected, like so many yeah. people our age, right? Yep. <laughs> it's yes. not how it's, it was intended. Quite hip. But it's quite hip, by it turns out. <laughs> we discovered it. And then we, we started talking when I when I saw what you did um, when COVID hit, and it was impacting so many businesses, mine included, and, and knowing you were in banking. I think I reached out to you for advice on um, yep. PPP loan. Uh, we won't go down that road right now. That's that's. Oh. An, in the rearview mirror for all of us, thank goodness. Um, and it was like we we you know had um, had been in touch all along. It was it was really a neat thing to do. Awesome. And you were gracious to stop your very very busy hectic time to to help me out, which I very much appreciate. So thank you for that. But um, oh, you know, it's it's one of the you know there's a lot of bad about social media, but there's certainly a lot of good um, in in terms of bringing people together who would otherwise we probably never would have would have talked again. That, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I mean, I look around at the tools and that's a tool, right? Just like anything else. And it can be used for good and it can be used for bad and, you know, uh, so forth. But I, you, you asked about kids and like, I tell my kids all the time, like you're at the apex of human civilization, right? Like, like it is your every whim, you know, these things and the, the level of entertainment provided on this and, and so forth. But you know, I, I try to tell them all the time that you're going to be dealing with groups of people for the rest of your life, right? And generally speaking, it's going to be a small group. It won't be a big group. Even if you go to a, a huge university and you are in a big course, normally they'll have a study group, right? You'll have six to 10 people. And, and honestly, my entire life is dictated by groups of six to 10 people. I, you know, I mean, that's, I have six to 10 people reporting to me. Um, my boss has six to 10 people reporting to them. Like, this is how we organize. And I don't know why that is, you know, maybe it's the rule of golden proportion. I don't really know how this whole thing works, but, but that is how we interact. And so I'm constantly talking to my kids, like, how do you do that? Right. How do you, how do you form relationships with people that you don't necessarily get along with, don't see eye to eye with and, and, um, and communication is a huge part of that. Empathy is a huge part of that, and 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 inquiry, right? So the 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 thing that I will say when I'm you know talking to interviewing people and so forth is like if you if you're not a naturally inquisitive person, it's really really difficult to be around. Sure, yeah, for, for anyone, right? So so I always tell my kids when they're talking about, well, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. You have to ask questions. Exactly. And isn't that such a simple thing for us to comprehend? Yep. But at that age, you know, at the K, your oldest is what, 20? I think? 20, almost 21. Yeah. Almost 21. So he's the same age as my number two. And then um, your youngest is how old? 14. 14. Okay. So my youngest is 14. So we, we're in the same yeah. range. It seems so simple. And I, I you know, told my boys last night, I was picking up one of uh, my kids um, from a football camp. Uh, two nights ago and a boy who I knew he's, he was not in the same grade as one, um, one of mine, but yeah, we, we knew each other in middle school. I know his parents, he could have, he walked by me. He could have easily walked by and avoided eye contact. And I wouldn't have thought anything of it. Um, you know, you, we can all picture the situation, but, but he didn't, he, he made a point of saying, hi, Mr. Newsom. And it just stood out. It was such an easy thing. And the kid was automatically elevated in, in my yeah. eyes. So much so that I texted his mom the next morning, who, who I've been friends with for a number of years. I said, I know you already know how polite your son is, but I just had to tell you, you know, it just stood out. And you know, I hope my mind would do that. I'm not sure they always would. They claim that they always do when I'm not around, right? But what a simple thing um, to acknowledge other people. And to your point, 
just ask about them. Everyone likes to be for someone to be interested in. Everyone likes for, to be acknowledged. I mean, it, that is universal, isn't it? It is. It is. And and um, you know, these are things that, again, as equally, these tools are great. They're they're removing that that ability. And so, you know, I know we'll we'll get back to my career in a bit. But you know, several years ago, I began to look at. And, you know, you and I connected at the beginning of COVID. My biggest concern throughout that was the development of our young people. And so I, I, I feel like yourself, myself, people have been around the block a little bit. You know, if we get isolated for a little bit, it might might actually be a nice welcome, um, <laughs> you know, to kind of tone things down. Our kids were not are not equipped for that. And so we are social creatures. And that was my biggest concern with the school sh- shutdowns and a lot of these various things that you and I talked about is that, you know, there's no free lunch and there was certainly a cost to COVID in real lives and so forth. But I, I got into the, you know, and we've talked about this before. I'm a scout master of a, of a boy scout troop and, and we actually do a whole class on teaching how to shake hands and look someone in the eye. Like we'll spend an entire week once a year. We have these new kids come in and they, and we, we set up seven or eight or 10 adults and I'm blessed to have like a doctor and an engineer and all these humans. And we just have them come and look us straight in the eye and shake their hand and say, hello, nice to meet you. Uh, how are you? You know, basic reading stuff, because you're right. The, the bar on sad, sad as it is, the bar on that particular thing is pretty low. And, and we have to, to train on that. So um, I'm, I'm proud of that kid too. tell his mom I'm, Good job. Yeah, I will. I will. Maybe she'll listen. I'll ask her too. <laughs> you know the, you know, and it, it, I, we will talk about your career, but I think these things are very tied together. As I uh, have shared with you, um, when I invited you to come on on the podcast, you know, we just launched this website, which I've been planning for about nine months now, um, to give career advice and guidance. And mm-hmm. the point of the podcast is really to speak with people about their career journey how they've led to, um, how it's led to where they are today. Um, rarely, you know, have these journeys you know, been something you could script. Um, there's, they're almost always, you know, um, there's always, almost always adversity and, and challenges. You know, life's not easy. We know that. But I don't know that young people know that. And so, you know, one of the challenges that I'm trying to accomplish with, with all of this is to tell young people what they need to hear, which isn't necessarily what they want to hear. And that's yes. a dangerous thing in a world where differing opinions um, aren't popular. And so I'm telling you, this is someone who, when, we, when we've when you know, we caught up over the last couple of years and, and talked, we yes. do so very openly um, yes. and have talked about the challenges in the world. And that's one that I, I tell you, I'm not someone who historically is uh, minces words. I'm not someone who um, is afraid to speak out, as you know, and never was, right? It's not who I was in high school. It's not who I am today. Oh, Yep. yep. Um, but I'm a little afraid of this young generation because I, you know, I, I'm trying to find where that balance is of saying, this is what you really, really need to know. And you're not going to like it. I mean, I can have those conversations with my children. I have those conversations with kids I coach in sports. You, I'm sure, have those kids yep. conversations with the scouts. Um, yes. But to have it with the masses is, is a bit terrifying to me in a way. <laughs> I'm not someone who is afraid of those kind of things. Yeah, it, it is. And, and I think as I've gotten older, and I'm, I'm sure you're dealing with this now too, right? Like, it seems like every new person that I'm hiring, they're a kid to me. They're literally a kid, you know, and they could be my child. Yes. And, and that's the first time I'm at that point now. It's like, oh, you, I, yeah. And not like, you know, I had you when I was 13, like I'd have you in my twenties and you could be so, but the, the thing that I'm fascinated by, and I've been studying more and more about this is, you know, we hear about millennials and oh, the millennials that there's, that's actually a really um, um, prejudicial thing to say, right. To prejudge. But what I am fascinated by is, is, um, and we talked about this a little bit before, but is what really kind of motivates them. And, and so they're really capable of great things and amazing creativity. I would say a lot more creativity than I possessed at their age. I agree. Um, yep. And, and so how do you, how do you harness that and tell them that, you know, uh, God, I'm going to 
use this quote from Ryan Holiday, but the obstacle is the way, like how to make them understand that, that yes, this is gonna be tough. And yes, you have some good ideas, but the execution of this idea is gonna be challenging, extremely challenging. And, and how, and I think it, I, Pete, I think the, the way you get through that is the nature of intent, right? And so us both being parents, I think it comes a little bit easier to us, which is, you know, this is not done to hurt you. This is done to, um, you know, prepare you uh, because right. this is this is how it's going to be. And it's not the world I invented, nor is it the world I inherited. It's just the world. Yep. And this is how our journey is going to go. And there is no journey I'm aware of that isn't beset with like obstacles and challenges and, and oftentimes insurmountable ones that appear that way at least. And then they get surmounted and then your, your worldview changes. So, well, and, and, and if, and if there weren't challenges, right. And then there, it wouldn't be rewarding. And I think about that a lot. Um, you know, with our kids, it's different because they're, you, know, you could say they're a captive audience when it comes to, right. You know, taking the advice, they don't really have much of a choice. Oh, um, they don't. And no. and you know, I'm I'm sure you know maybe you're luckier than me, but yeah, you know, my it's often met with eye rolls. And um, in the moment, I don't think it's it's you know anyone wants it, right? Well, they never want it. Um, no. But you know, after the fact, the hope is that they appreciate it. You know that that it sticks at some level. The the you know what we're trying to do now is. You know, how do we share that to a broader group who doesn't, who is not a captive audience, who who chooses, you know, who gets a lot of bad advice elsewhere? I mean, that's what, you know, I've realized as a manager. That's what I've realized being in staffing. That's what I've realized as a parent of four. I'm sure, you know, you, you manage a, a large group, as, as you said, you know, a lot of younger people. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you've had the same um, perspective on that, but, you know, there's a lot, you know, the younger generation, and this is dating myself, right? But what, so be it. Um, it, it almost is it, like set up for a frustration, a frustrating time because you know the parenting, and I think this has changed. But for for you know the past much of the past fifteen years, my observation has been that parents want their kids to be happy at a young age. They want them to be satisfied and content and, and not frustrated and not, um, not have to struggle at a young age, which is kind of the entire, like entirely opposite of the way we were raised. It is. And I think, you know, I was thinking about this today um, and you're only a year younger than me. So you'll remember this. There were gas lines. Like we waited in a car for 45 minutes to go through a gas pump. Right. I don't know if you remember that I was about six or seven or eight years old, but like, and it, those ideas are just so foreign to people, right? Like, holy smokes, like you had to really tighten. We've had a, a period of unprecedented economic growth. We've had a, an unprecedented period of peace. And I talk about this with people all the time because the negativity of, oh, it's so tough right now. It's just not true. It, you know, it's, it's just not true. We, we have the least amount of violence of humans against other humans as a percentage in the history of the world. And, and so you, you bring up an excellent point, which is um, in light of all that good news, how do you develop calluses, right? Like how do you, do you to develop the rough skin that carries you through a difficult period? And, and, you know, there's nothing but experience that will allow you to do that. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, we're, we're, I'm hopeful that those kids, they, they will have it. They're humans. And every human that has ever gone through something like this, their vast majority of them find the will and the way to get there. Cause that's why we're so prosperous today. I mean, that's, and, and we have kids that are products of us and we're products of our grandparents and like, Absolutely. We'll get there. I, 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 yeah. The, you know, the concern that I have as a parent and you know, generationally too, is the, the product of good times isn't necessarily the, the, as motivated as the individual who's a product of, of tough times. And I, but I also think motivation comes in different at different times in different ways. And um, I, I am excited because this is such an incredible time of opportunity. Yeah. 
where, as you said, it's never been a better time to be a, a, a alive. It's never been a better time to live on this planet, even though we're surrounded by what seems to be a lot of difficulty and challenges. And yeah, the world is not, the world has never been a good place, right? I mean, the world has always been uh, right. brought with danger and, and difficulty yes. and disease. And none of these things are new. Now, Twitter's new. Right. Yes. The, the way things are in our face 24 seven, that's all new. But yeah. I you know, spent some time uh, researching diseases around the world when COVID was coming out. And you know, there are things that I had no idea. Malaria, for example, oh, oh, yes. I had no idea how many people died of malaria. How many kids die of starvation every year? And we're, you know, and, and we, you know, we've lost our minds over, you know, um, you know, over COVID, not to say it wasn't yeah. serious, but these kind of things are not new, um, far from it. And it, it, they're going on right now. We just weren't paying attention. And so that's the yeah. difference is our awareness has evolved. I, I, I think that's true. And, 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 uh, you know, I have a theory on this. I don't think there's any proof of this, but I think we certainly have the most amount of generations alive now. Right. Sure. So, yep. I mean, I saw someone on Instagram. It was incredible. It was like this six women and they were all, you know, one descendant of the other. And yeah, I that's thought, never happened in that's history before. Never happened. Right. So, so what, so what happens then is, and I, you know, it's just kind of a crazy theory, but I think we're, we haven't really been aware of our own mortality. Right. Um, I, you know, one of the things, I lost, uh, we'll talk about it later, perhaps, but, you know, I, I went through a difficult period where my mother had real bad health problems and it was all through high school and then through college and then graduation. So I kind of got, I got a real keen eye on the fact that, Hey, we've got a, we got a limited time here to play like, and, and, and how important that is to take advantage of the time that you have. Um, but I think there's a lot of people that haven't, and God bless, you know, what a miracle that you haven't had as many family funerals as people our age did 40 years ago, you know? And I think all those things contribute to um, how impactful a disaster can be, quote unquote, or, or a significant event. But relatively speaking, again, we're in, in blessed, blessed, blessed times. So um, anyway. No doubt, we we are. So let, let's explore that because we've. Um, it, I kind of want to walk through yeah. your your professional history, which does start, yes. of course, with you know that time in school. And I did not know that what, what you just said. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mom, as you mentioned early in the uh, when we got on that we weren't close. We we were friendly. We had a good mutual right. friend that brought us together. Um, yeah. But I had no idea. So. Um, you know, yeah. So she, she, that. um, it was an interesting about 13, 14 years old. She had smoked all of her life emphysema dad's out on a, on a trip and, you know, I'm caring for her blue lipped because of lack of oxygen. And so <clears throat> just went through a really difficult health period at that time. I was, my brother's 12 years older than I am. So I'm kind of like an only child. And, and my dad was, was 47 years old when I was born and my mom was 40. Oh, which wow. at that time was pretty old, right? Sure. Yeah. So, so I never did. There was no throwing the ball in the backyard. There was not like not. My dad was too tired. He was sixty-five when I graduated high school. You know, like so. So I'm thinking about even now. Like I, I felt like I had kids late, and it was nowhere close to my father. So I went through that experience, and it was. And my dad was an electrical engineer and really believed in education. So I put a lot of pressure on myself to perform well in school. And I did. I took all the AP classes and got this full ride to Eckerd, which was amazing. Um, but I went as a pre-med student. So I was, I was going to be a doctor and um, spent about two years taking unbelievably challenging courses. And my second semester of my sophomore year, I took... Botany 2, Calc 2, Chem 2, and Physics 2. And so anyone who's ever been in those programs, and Pete, you saw me in college. I enjoyed my college life, right? So I'll never forget when I entered the, the biology program, they said there's two hours out of, out of class for every one hour in class. Well, my class schedule was Monday through, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, it was like 9 to 3.30 because you had labs. And then Tuesday and Thursday, I had nine to one classes. So when you add all that up, it was like four hours of sleep. 
And as you well know, I like playing beach volleyball. I like doing all the fun things that we did the weekend you came and visited. But I took all those courses second semester of my sophomore year, and it was a big load. And, um, you know, I think I averaged a C plus. And, you know, I'm on a full ride honors program scholarship. And so my father calls. And I, I mean, I love this to this day. It's a great story, but I love the fact that he did this. He calls and he says, I need a meeting with your academic advisor. And uh, <laughs> and he calls him. We, we didn't have cell phones. You know that, right? There was a phone in the dorm and I picked right. up the phone. And I was like, OK. And so the next thing you know, um, I get a meeting with the head of the biology department and my father. And we all sit down at this little round table. And and uh, the professor says, well, Mr. McCall, what would you what would you like to meet about? And he said, well, um, I think it's time that all of us came to terms with the fact that my son's not going to be a physician. Uh, <laughs> unless, unless, unless he ends up at the Guadalajara, Guadalajara Medical School, you know, he's like, and he really busted my chops about it. And I'm sitting there and I was just blown away. And I was like, oh yeah, the gig's up, right? Like that, that's it. And because he essentially said, this school is very expensive. We cannot afford it. And if he loses his scholarship going down this academic path, we've got a problem. And so, um, you know, I'm a big believer in passion. You and I have talked about this. I think it carries so many people I've met that are extremely successful. And the reality was I didn't have a passion for medicine. I, I had an aptitude for it. I had an aptitude for the science of it, but it wasn't something I really wanted to do at the end of the day. So I ended up switching majors, graduated in four years, which was amazing. But, um, you know, I took 40, I took 22 credit hours each of my Oh my! My, sen my senior it? year, I took six classes a semester, and and wow. because I had to finish, my father he fought in the second world. Well, let me. He didn't say he fought. He he was a civil engineer uh, because he was flat footed. He broke his back in the war, took the GI Bill, and graduated in engineering school in three years. Oh, wow. So the idea that I was going to take four years was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> and all your my mind. Our mutual buddy was taking five years. Everybody I knew was taking five years. And he's like, we, we don't do college in five years. Like four years is the limit. So I ended up finishing all that and I graduated. But about that time, you know, coming back to my mother's health, she was really in a bad way. She was on a full full time um, uh, tracheotomy and, and uh, a ventilator. So uh, really, really, neither one of them could come to my graduation. And my brother never went to college. So it was like, this was a big event and uh, couldn't come to college. And so, you know, at that time I was pretty lost. I would say glad I got everything done and I got my degree, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And, and literally spent a good part of my senior year in the hospital. There were months on end that they were in the hospital. My father also ended up having lung cancer, thankfully recovered, but oh, um, so it was just tough. Right. And, and, yeah. You know, I certainly had my good times when I could have my good times, but I, I mean, I really, life hit me pretty quick on that. And so, uh, but then I graduated and, you know, we didn't have something like the Finding Careers End podcast. I didn't know what I was going to do. Like I, I, so, so there was a career day and someone from Metropolitan Life showed up and I was a pretty likable dude. And I thought, well, yeah, let's, let's see if we can't make some money. And, and uh, you know, I went to work for that company, great training, but it was like, Hey, call all your buddies that have money. Well, <laughs> That's it. And you don't have no, any buddies with money. No, 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 I, 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 we were, we were trying to figure out how to split dollar beer night. Like, I mean, so, so it was, it was a real interesting thing. So I went to work for him though, but the training was incredible. So um, about that time, my, my mother had passed away and I met the love of my life, um, believe it or not. And, and she was one that it was like, I mean, I love her. We've been married 28 years now, but I, I love her to death. And, but she had her act together, man. She was like manager of a, of a store and like, she just knew what she was doing. And, um, and I fell in love with her. I, uh, our buddy, Tom, who, you know, uh, we, we met her at a, at a place and I said, I'm going to marry that girl. He said, you're so full of it. As you well know, I was voted class flirt of 1988. So <laughs> he, he, um, he thought that's a bunch of nonsense, but I did. I fell in love with her from the moment I saw her. That's and, right. And a big part of it was that she was just, you know, she, she wouldn't 
buy any of my nonsense. She put me to the task. And, and so I, I really respect her immensely. Well, my mom passed, my dad was, was doing pretty well and she was from Oklahoma. So we wanted to move back. She wanted to move back to Oklahoma. So it seemed like an opportune time. I went to work for an agency here in Oklahoma that specialized in property and casualty as opposed to like Matt life. And I went around and, um, I sold group health insurance plans to municipalities throughout the state of Oklahoma. So it's incredible to even think about now. I was 24, maybe 25 years old, and I'm literally presenting with an accent. I'm, I understand I have a little bit of an Oki accent now. I did not have that then. And I would go around and present to city council members in small towns in Oklahoma. And it was just baptism by fire great experience wouldn't trade it for anything did that for um that's not um, easy that, yeah that's it's no easy to, to you know to move to a, a place where you know nobody other than who you moved with right you moved for a great reason yep. i did not know that so that's that's interesting because i've yep. been i just hadn't, haven't had the opportunity to ask how, how the heck did you end up in oklahoma of all places right it's not the most natural place to move for as a floridian right. um nope. But yeah, you had a, you were, you were motivated for, for the yes. right reason. So that, yes. so that makes sense, but going and, and selling anything, which, which is difficult, especially when what you're selling is not the most unique product, but, you know, it's one That's thing right. to sell a Tesla. <laughs> it's another thing to sell yeah, insurance ooh, coverage. That excitement. 10 other companies sell the same thing. So what, what, uh, how did you get through that? You know, I think this is where those analytical skills that made me good in science and math and so forth, I was able to, to analyze pretty quickly what some of those advantages were. And in many cases, too bad, but in many cases it was price, but there were benefits that you needed to talk about and so forth. And I could go through that process pretty quickly. And I've always had a pretty good ability to communicate those on terms that aren't as complicated, let's say. So... How did I make that shift? I don't know. I think, you know, my mother's passing and other stuff had a big impact on how I kind of viewed the world. So I didn't, I wasn't afraid. I was like, whatever, you know, this is not the worst thing that could ever happen to a person is to get, you know, I never got booed down at a city council meeting, but you know, you can see the blank faces. It's like, all right, you know, so be it. But it, it taught me a lot about getting a thick skin, right? And so um, learning a lot about how to, understand what other people are, are, um, are carrying around. I got a guy named John Martin. I'll never forget this. So when I was with MetLife and I had been making a bunch of calls, you know, and it was God awful. And I just got beaten down like you wouldn't believe. And, and he comes over and he's like, what's wrong? I said, Oh man, these people don't want to talk to me. It's horrible. You know, it's just the horrible worst thing. And he said, Hey man, like, don't, don't worry about that. He goes, probably tell me about the last person you talked. I said, well, it was this woman and I heard a baby in the background and he's like, yeah, so like she's washing one kid in the in the sink and the other one is on her hip and she's working the pan in the kitchen. And he's like, why would that's not about you, right? It's not about you. Right. It's about them. And I thought, oh, that was something. And I really that has helped me a lot in my career, understanding and golly, particularly in the last two years, understanding people's reactions you know, and I think we've been under so much stress. So when you see something really unusual, you go, oh, that may not be about me, right? We tend to internalize. So that was a really good lesson. Um, yeah, and and it's it's something that if being in the staffing business, I talk to our you know, new hires quite a bit about, um, which is you have to understand in any situation, people are gonna do what's best for them, what they believe is yeah. best for themselves. And as, you have to operate with that in mind all the time. It's never about what you want. Right? It's That's about right. what they want if you're having That's to sell anything to anyone. And, and unless you're focused on that, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be very good at it. Right? You're not gonna do it for very long. Probably. And, and that's exactly right, which leads back to this being inquisitive and understanding people and understanding what their challenges are. Um, it, it's so, frankly, it's, you know, it's the nature of being helpful which is to say um, you've got to understand where someone's at if you want to be helpful. And it doesn't matter if it's your spouse or your neighbor or your kids, like you have to understand where they're at to offer any of those things. Why do you think that's so hard for people to do? I mean, look right now where everything is divisive, any issue seemingly 
It's just neutral issues, right? Unimportant things, insignificant things. People take a stand on and get and get angry that that the you know, the the opposing view exists. Why, why do you think that is? As human, I mean, it should be inherently I, I think, empathetic, right, to some degree. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, I really do think we're fighting biology on so much of this. I think, you know, we're we're. I have three sons, right? So I jokingly say to them all the time, and they're well aware of this, that the male frontal lobe doesn't fully develop until it's 30. And that's where all these higher thoughts of helpfulness, and being a, you know, all the great things that create art philosophy. And some people develop that sooner. Women certainly do. Um, but I think we're pre-programmed to kind of fight or flight. You know, we, and that's an autonomic response where if we're challenged or we're, um, um, it, and we're naturally kind of self-centered, I think any organism probably is, right? So we, so we're in this fight or flight mechanism all the time. And we, as higher evolved, you know, beings have to go, okay, now wait a minute. Like, this is not the, the time to fight, right? This is not. And when you look at God, art, philosophy, everything, it's always about this nature of, of um, well, judo, right? Uh, uh, any of these things, using, using someone else's um, uh, ability against them. I wouldn't even say that, but just not fighting. How about that? Not fighting. And so I think it's hard for us to, to avoid that innate desire to be in that contentious mode. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, 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 I've evolved over, over time with that. I'm not even far from perfect, but I, you know, things that bothered me when I was younger, as you said, the other 30, it wasn't, I don't know that that's a magical number, but for me, it was more about going from being insecure to, to secure and how, how that transition happens. I don't know, but I wish someone had told me at a younger age, like chill out. Right. Like it just, it's, you have plenty of time, um, yeah. continue in the right direction, right? Don't, don't, don't waste your time, but, right. um, enjoy it along the way. And that's, that's, you know, if I could go back, you know, to my younger self, I, I probably would take things a little more seriously at a younger age, but, but also I, I would have just enjoyed the moment more and instead of looking for something to worry about, which was <laughs> sort of my nature or, or be yeah. bothered by yeah, I, I want something I didn't have or, or be focused on other people and what they did have, which, you know, thank goodness that passed. But, um, I, I, I you know, it, it is a curious thing as to why we aren't just naturally just more accommodating and flexible and, and easy to get along with. Yeah. I, yeah. It's a, it's a good question. I, you, I mentioned 30, but you know, I was, golly, I was 32 when I had my first one, my first child. And that was a pivotal moment um, for me, both professionally, personally, everything. I was like, oh, that then it really hit. Oh, this is really not about me, like at all. And and it it helped inform my intentions and my outlook from that point forward. Right. So um, we we when you mentioned what you're saying, which is, you know, that envy, you don't want to what the seven deadly sins or whatever, all those things that enter into your mind, more often than not come out of insecurity, right? And the insecurity comes out of, um, I think, a natural state of being insecure, right? Like not knowing what to do. I mean, mean, is it insecure? Maybe it's insecure. I think it was for me, but it was more of just lack of contentedness, right? You know, however you want to phrase that. And and yes, right now in the world that that seems to be a, a pretty prevalent thing um how can you be content when you're you know when when, when you can't afford you know to, to pay that's your bills true. right how, that, how can you be content when you're being told you can't leave the house without being fearful i mean I, look i'm in florida as you know and yeah. even today i went to um the lab to, to have some blood work done and they're, they're, they're wearing masks <laughs> I don't, I don't I, wear mask, I man. i'm looking around going we're still, we're still doing this. Like, and then, and, and there's everyone in the lobby, every worker and still, you know, going to war. And I'm, and I was thinking in my mind, like you're having to come to work fearful. And the lady clearly who you know, made me wear it yes. she's doing her job. I was like, wow, why are we still doing this? I thought, you know, she was going to be with me. She wasn't. Um, uh, it, it, she said, well, because it's a safe thing to do. I'm like, wow, what a, what a, 
Well, I, I think you've, you've hit into something, you know, and I'm, you know, we've talked a little bit about this during the last two years, which faith was an incredible um, help to me throughout that process. And, you know, I don't think there's any accident, regardless of your creed or theology, but I don't think there's any accident that within the Bible, um, the, the words that God speaks to their people more than any others fear not. Right. And, and so I don't think that's an accident, regardless of what your position is on the Bible, whether you believe it or not, or anything. Yes, either yeah. someone said it or someone wrote it. Either way, it ended up there. And it's it's, it's for a ancient long, long text <laughs> that's lasted 2,000 years. And, and so now you have to explore, like, what does fear do for you? So we talked a little bit about scouting. Um, uh, I've, these kids are, are awesome. I mean, you know, I've got three boys in it. One's an Eagle Scout already. But, you know, we talk about this all the time of slaying your dragons, right? And, and, and one of which was, God, I've been afraid of caves, you know, tight controlled spaces and, you know, with some other adult leaders, I got into a cave, Pete, and I'm telling you, like, I had to get on my belly and oh. crawl with my elbows for like 30 feet. And it's just, I mean, the most mentally terrifying point in my life. And I almost cracked my head open just jumping from being in that confined space. Um, but, you know, I, there is something to be said for nothing to fear but fear itself. Like, we, we are not meant by whatever divine creator you believe, we are not meant to live in a state of fear. And, and I think that it's, it informs what we do. God, it formed what I did from a career perspective. Like, oh, we got, I don't know if I can do that. That's taking a risk. I mean, look what you did within your own business. It's like. It, also it motivated won't. by fear, by the way. Yes. I mean, I, I started the business because I was fearful. Okay. Isn't that weird? Tell me right? It's not what you would think. Yeah, mo what most people would think. I um, the catalyst it was a couple things. I talked about doing it for ten years, but it was, we can call it afraid, right? Could never justify doing it. Well, bills to pay, you know, getting married, getting you know, having having a having a baby, buying a house, having another baby. There's yep. never a good time to do it because just taking a risk, right? And and there was right. inherent fear of of taking that risk. Um, the ultimate catalyst for me was when, at the time I was mid thirties, my, um, my VP, uh, who, um, I've never told this publicly, uh, before who, uh, was an amazing guy, did everything right. I mean, just our, he managed a, a region of 300 people. I was working for a very large organization and he was just a great guy. He did everything right. He was reorged out of his job one day and he wasn't as good, a, a good enough buddies with the guy who made the decision or lady who made the decision as the other people were who didn't get reorged out. So they took two layers of VP, made it into one, and he was on the outside looking in. And that, that scared the hell out of me because I thought here I am with a, you know, a poli sci degree, um, yep. which qualifies me to do nothing right. Other than sell, which is what I was doing. Right. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, a, a, a GPA that I've never put on on paper, right? And um, never right. will. We'll lie to my kids about it. Right. They, I just, right. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, they don't need to see that transcript. No, no, no not at all. But um, I, I thought this is this is he's in the role that I'm aspiring to be in, and yet he's now out of a job um, right. because of someone else, and and right. and it was beyond his control. And so my fear was that I was going to end up that way. And, and so I didn't start my business because I was so kind. I, mean, I was confident to a degree. I knew I could sell right. and the whole living that way. And so that's, that was a huge piece of it, but it was, I was afraid not to start it because okay. I, 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 I was like, I'd rather have my ball, the ball in my hands than have my fate determined by someone. I don't know who is in a corporate office, four or five, six levels above me, whatever it is. Right. So that was, that was actually a w huge wake up call for me. And that was a catalyst to step off the cliff and do it. But it still was awfully scary. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you look at all the things that go into that and I did the same, you know, I worked for this insurance agency and I went out on my own um, and, and, and developed, started my own agency and yeah, started. So, tell, so tell me what led to that. Cause it is a huge decision to make. And people look at you like you're nuts when you do it, especially well, 
so for me, and I think you and I have talked about this, but I'm not sure, like, um, and, and God bless, there are people that are very good at this. I'm more relationship based. I just am, right? I, I, I think, um, I think from a business perspective, relationships last, whereas transactions are at the whim of a lot of different forces, market forces, commodity forces, doesn't matter what it is. And so as I, and I, and I'll tell you one, uh, this, this is what led to it. So I'm, I'm calling on the small city, which will name, uh, which will not be named um, in this, in the state of Oklahoma. And I've got the better deal. And I know I've got the better deal. And it's not like close. It's not like, well, I can understand. So what do I do? I decide to play a little politics. I call every single one of the city council and I talk with them about this deal that this city manager will not let you see. It wasn't even going to be presented. Oh, wow. And so I, uh, I go in there and, um, and I win the deal. I win the deal. And as I'm leaving, I'm so excited. Man. I mean, I'm 24, 25. You think I just, and I walk out of there and the city manager goes, you know, every agent in the state is going to quote us next year because you will never write this again. Really? And I thought, oh, that's what the business I'm in. Like this is quoted every single year. And I'm going to be doing this every single year until I'm 68 years old. Like this, this is not the business I want to be in. So I literally said, I've got to be in the relationship business where, and, and so in this financial services business where people's situation changes and so forth. So then I have relationships and as they, their situation changes, I can provide different products and services as opposed to one product. To a multitude of people so that was a huge shift and that was i i, I literally said I'm, i can't do this like my i'm gray enough as it is but with if i had done that forget it. i'd look 70 years old right now so i that was the big catalyst i said i can't do this so i got into a relationship relationship based business it was primarily directed it, it, to retirees and senior citizens and okay. it worked really really well and i made a good living and but as you well know when you're self-employed there are months when you've made 10x and there's months that you've made x and, and sometimes years and a lot of zeros and and so when mama's okay. wanting to have babies yep and and so forth um she literally said are we going to we didn't have a family. And I thought, yeah, that's probably a good idea. And so, um, so I started looking at it and I actually had an opportunity to sell my agency, which worked out to be really good financial move for me. And I was kind of lost, but I will say it was a very lonely business. I didn't get as much of that team, that six to 10 people that I'm interacting with all the time. And, and so our good buddy that you and I both know, uh, said, why don't you try banking? And, and I'm like, banking? Well, you know, he was smart right out of college, he got into an internship program, started climbing the corporate ladder. I, uh, I was 29 years old and not, I was no longer in that window of people that they said, Hey, let's do this. And so I literally uh, worked, uh, I worked as a uh, relationship banker, a retail banker. So if you went into a location, so I went from, Hey, I do whatever I want, whenever I want into a corporate America role where I literally, I mean, lunches were discussed and when people were taking lunches yeah, you're accountable to other people it, for your time for yes where you it, are i mean that's how how was that transition because usually it's the opposite right and, and i struggled with going from having a manager to not and that, that was hard i mean it took me years to become comfortable with not having anyone to ask you know for help from and, and those sort of things but how was it going the other way because that would be a difficult thing for me right now I, I, I know, but it's, it's not completely uncommon either to go from, you know, back to corporate. I, it wasn't easy, but you know, this is, um, it's one of those things that I think has really helped me in my career. Cause there's times I've been really emotional, right. And you, you bring all that baggage, but it, I mean, it was, it was a little bit humbling, you, right? You so you were never emotional. No, there were times when I was emotional. Like, not, all right, now you're making fun of me. So, I, I'm a little bit. I am. Yeah. Right so, so yeah. So I, I, um, I, but I started realizing like, okay, this is where your life has led you. Right. And I, and, and I did have a kid come and it was like, okay, so you're going to have to, you're going to have to do this a different way. 
And that was the honest God truth. Like I'm not, there's no internship program. I'm not going to learn how to analyze credit financially. Like I'm going to have to do that on my own. Like there's no, there's no support system here, but, but the one thing, and I will, you know, this is a powerful lesson. I've said this to many people as, as they've advanced in their career. It's like, I also knew what the job was and I did the job really well. Like right. I didn't bring my ego into it and say, Oh my goodness, I've been out on my own for seven years. No, I knew what the job was. I did the job very well. And I, I, and I just had this conversation the other day with someone in my organization. It's like, and I'm not talking 10% above my goal. I'm right. talking 200% of my goal. And, and, and you know, the eyes, the eyes light up. What do you mean? I said, yeah, that's, I literally said, okay, if I'm going to, if I'm going to have any opportunity to be where I am today, the effort cannot be even marginally. It can't even be excellent. It's got to be exemplary. Like it's, it's got to be just beyond, beyond. And that's, so I got in that role and I did it for like four and a half years. And then an opportunity to become a small business lender, which was, I mean, these are business loans that are limited to 250,000. So I'm dealing with a lot of closely held, like usually mom and pop companies oh, yeah. that want to buy a van. They want a $50,000 line of credit, which by the way, I love those businesses. They're the backbone of our country. And so they're putting it all on the line with those. Loans, oh, right? No doubt. And so, you, you, so I did that and it was like the same thing. I'm like, all right, there's no doubt what I have to do here. And I just killed it. And I put in all the hours now. My, we were we made some really difficult decisions. Like in my case, we, my wife decided to stay home with our kids, and we were probably not in a financial position to really. But yeah, and I don't I don't mean this. Uh, people can choose to do whatever they want, but we found that there were some financial savings to her staying home. Right? Sure. Like, you know, laundry. I was, I was reading an article about that earlier this week about, about you know, mothers deciding whether it makes sense to go back to work, given childcare costs, the expenses, gas, having a second, you know, car, all of those things, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at your paycheck, what's coming in versus what's going out, there's a trade off, not to mention we'd be, rem we can ignore this. We can, right. it's not popular perhaps. However, I can tell you that my success uh, my ability to succeed has been supported yeah. by Jen, you know, not working because, you know, there's times where someone has to go to the doctor, someone has to go to the store, someone has to take care of life. And, and with, you know, more, you know, with one kid, let alone multiple kids, li there's a lot that goes into taking care of life. And yeah. I've never had to sacrifice professional professionally. And, um, you know, so I, I have a lot of admiration for people who do, but with no question, I mean, it's tough. I'm fortunate, but we've struggled, right? We made choices that were right for us, which that's meant that's right. Having less money at times. And we would have because we were looking ahead. I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, there's, there's a trade-off. There is a trade-off and, and, we, and I want to be very clear. That was my wife's decision. Like she wanted to be home with her children. And, and so she, she raised them. And in fact, you know, golly, five, six years ago, um, and this is a joke, but I, I, I meant it when I said it, so I'll say it here, which is, she said, I want to go back to work. And I was like, can you please set up an LLC? And we'll call it McCall Domestic Engineering Company, Inc. I don't care what, whatever. <laughs> I literally will, I will write you a check to run our household because your, your services are so valued to our family, right? Like I'm willing to put literal dollars and cents, but she wanted to, and she's actually a teacher now and she loves it. And I wouldn't deny her the right to go out and work for any circumstance, but I was able to dedicate a lot more time to my career, I think, than if we would have been juggling some of those things together. That was just our personal choice. Sure, no, no doubt. And, and it's, you know, what's right, for you isn't necessarily what's right for anyone else. We, we know that's that. right. And, I, and I've seen people do it that both are, and it works out great. Um, Absolutely. So, uh, so in our case, you know, I did that and then uh, literally um, uh, got into more of a commercial lender role and that kind of opened up, but go ahead. You were gonna ask. Well, you know, you said something profound that I don't, I don't want to, you know, we keep kind of blowing by some, some really important things and I, I know we could talk all, all night and we don't have that much time. Um, but you, you talked about the transition going back to, to working for you went to work for a bank 
and you you couldn't be average. You you weren't you know content to just be good or even great. You wanted to be exemplary. I think that was the word you used. Yep. I had a conversation with my daughter, who's a recent college graduate, the other day, and I said, you know, I don't expect you to do this. What I'm going to say, and I don't expect anyone to do this. Um, so if my employees are listening right now, I'm not talking to you. Okay, <laughs> I'm 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 speaking generally. But if someone who had who was on the uptick in their career, we'll just say, right? Someone who hasn't yet arrived where they're content to remain, which is pretty much everyone, right? Certainly I'm still there. Um, but if, if, if someone came to me as an employee and said, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I will work nights. I will work weekends. I will, you tell me what to do and I will do it. And then I'll ask for more, right? And if, if that employee existed, how yes. valuable would that employee be to the organization? How valuable would that employee be to your organization right now? If someone came to you and said that and meant it and spent the next year right, working around the clock effectively. Um, and this, this was a conversation. Maybe, maybe there were drinks. I, 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 I may but surprise you with, with this answer. Pete. You, you I, might. Um, well, for me, I would say, wow, that would, that person would be so valuable and stand out, right, and be recognized and have opportunity to advance. Um, it just, to, when I look back and think, that's what I did when I started my company. Yeah, I worked around the clock. I yep. didn't take a break. I outworked. I, I thought, I have to outwork everyone to survive, which I did. Right. Um, and that was my whole focus it, to, the, to the detriment of other things in my life, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, to the detriment mm -hmm. of my wife, my children. I mean, I had you know, a, a newborn, um, when I, when I started my business and I know that and, um, but it's what I was focused on doing. And so I, I just thought, why does that ha not happen more often? Because you just described that that's exactly what you did. Right. right. And, um, and you were successful as a result and that's not a coincidence. I wouldn't think. I don't, I don't think that. Yeah. And there, and my motivation, you know, talk, you talked a little bit about fear of ending up like this person who had been displaced, but Mine was just a real deep humility of, I didn't do these other steps, right? So I've like, and all those steps would have totaled seven or eight or 10 years worth of work that would have avoid, I would not have had to do that if I had done all those steps beforehand. So I was fully aware of it. Yeah, but, but, but I would what, say that- What if you had done it on top of all that? I, I'm well, just no, 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 there's no doubt. And there's times now where it's like, wow, I'm, I'm working harder than I ever have. I mean, and we talked about PPP and so forth. If you would have told me at that time in my career, I'm going to put in 20 hours a day. <laughs> it would have been like, what? What are you talking about? I'm a banker. We, we work right. from- You work less than everyone. Yeah, right. And of course, that those days are gone, by the way, just to dispel <laughs> that rumor. Well, wait, um, so, but you said you would differ. Your, my answer, your answer- say, I would right say now. this, that, that one of the things, and I work for a really incredible company, and it was a big part of the reason that I- that I chose to come to work here is, is, and we've talked a little bit about this with regard to millennials and so forth. And, and, and working for a purpose-driven company is really, really important, right? So, so um, we, we put God first, our family second, our jobs third, right? And that's, that's right on the front door. Like, so everybody understands that's kind of where we're at. And we also, we also um, are gonna make um, great teams. So I've had the occasion on a couple of, I would say since I've been in this role, a couple, a couple of times to hire one of those people that you just described. And, and I had to look at my team and go, is that what I need, right? Like right now, like I, I want a very good player, make no mistake, but my, my suspicion and my mindset is different than when I, 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 again, I had to do what I had to do because I had to protect my family and so on and so forth. And it spilled in over things like ego and so forth. But my experience has been generally speaking that when you meet that individual, generally it's about, I'm going to do whatever I need to do and I'll be here. And it's not for me or we, it's not for we, it's for me. And so the, the point I'm making is I'm not sure. I certainly think you can have people like that that can be um, exemplars, 
of how that works, but I think it's got to be the, the intention and the focus has got to be towards helping other people, not towards what it does for them. Well, and, and be, so that's, uh, you know, and I, I'll think through this more because I haven't actually had this conversation out loud since it, it first came up with, with my daughter where I you know, was saying, if I could go back to me in, at 22, 23, oh. where I didn't have children, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't married. Um, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I take advantage of that, you know, time to, to do it? And most people don't. And I, I just think it would... <laughs> It would stand out. And part of the reason well, I, it's been on my mind right now is, is, you know, with this new business, this new website, Zen gig and what mm -hmm. I want it to become for others, right. As well as for myself, if I'm being honest, because I want to, you know, I want this to be something amazing, right. I don't want to yep. do it and have it be good enough. I want it to be excellent. And yeah. I can't articulate why I just, if I'm going to do it, I want it, I want it to be as good as it can possibly be. Right. But I know that in order for it to be the best that it can be, it's going yes. to re require a level of focus and commitment. That yes. means I have to go back to that mode I was in 18 years ago when I started the staffing company where I'm going to, uh, it's going to be to the detriment of other things, like I was saying. And I'm on the edge of, I haven't yet made that commitment right. because I know what it means. And I know it's, it's blinders and I know it's, you know, my family's going to suffer. My relationships, my friendships are going to suffer. My health will probably suffer. And though that's a, that, that's a tough place to be as a, you know, I, you know I'm going to challenge you as your friend. I, I think that's the, that's the 25 year old Pete. I think the, the age Pete now is understands how to, how to do that a little bit better. Pete's a little bit smarter. Pete uses Calendly and, other things to schedule and allocate his time properly. Like, I think one of the things, um, and I don't, I think we, we can tell ourselves a story a lot about how we've had experiences and this is going to be exactly like that. You know, I don't know, Pete, I think, I think passion carries so much. Right. And I can sense that, that your passion around this project is not for your own benefit. Yes. I think, I think you feel driven that you can help. And that's a different than I'm going to succeed, right? There's a different mindset. And, and whether it's the experience of raising a family or raising a business or however you want to do it, you begin, I, for me anyway, and this is, golly, you get back to scouting. It really happened with my oldest when he started playing football. It was like, you know, when, you, when you're a little bit older and we were a little bit older, not significantly older, but we went to birthing classes and all these kind of things. And it was like, holy smokes, we're the older parents, like, we had nobody we knew, right? Nobody we knew that were our age that had kids. So every time we go to school, it's like, oh, what are the grandparents here? You know, and you we're not even. Weren't. You not, definitely we're not, were not the older I, parents. I know, but we. I felt that way, right? But when I started getting involved in coaching, yeah. when I started getting involved in volunteering, when I started looking at how I can help others as opposed to what my own personal desires, needs, goals are, um, life got a lot better. Yep. I mean, it like, like, like infinitely better, like financially better, um, fulfillment better, put your head on the pillow better, everything, you know, my, my development of my marriage, my development of my, my kids and who they're turning out to be just got better because, that competitive guy who traveled all over the state and sold insurance, like he wanted to win. You know what I mean? He wanted to win. And sometimes he wanted to win the battles at the expense of the war. And what's happened through it, through parenthood and, and really involvement in the community is I I've started to see a lot bigger purpose than just myself and, and so forth. And I think that's, to me, it seems like Pete, I don't know. We've not talked a bunch about it, but that's kind of a huge desire for you is that we, that we can be a resource. This can be a resource for people to go, okay, it's not a straight line from a, from a career perspective. I mean, I had, it wasn't too late for me to become a banker and, right. and I had to put in a lot of effort and a lot of extra effort that I wouldn't have had to probably put in if I had just started at 22, but I didn't and that's okay. But showing more stories of how people can overcome obstacles. Cause I haven't even gotten to the career part where, you know, I was a very large institution who I respect immensely, but 
I got passed over, you know, I'd be the top producing guy. Right. And it's like, and not only the top producing in this state, like in the company, like now we're, we're going we're to have to do this in two parts. I know <laughs> because, because it, what, there's so many things that I, I, I'm not going to have time to ask you today. Um, right. which, which, one of those is, but I'm going to ask you now, I don't know if you, if you've reconciled this in your mind. I don't know if I'm just reading, you know, it as you're talking, but you mentioned a level of seriousness that you applied to your career when you moved to Oklahoma that you didn't have in college, right? You didn't even mention your college degree. I didn't ask you because I know what you majored in, but you didn't even mention it, right? Because it right. was insignificant to, uh, not, not significant enough for you to even mention. Right. So that, th that was clearly not you know, something that drove you, right. but you met the, you know, the girl that you, you, you right. committed to marrying and suddenly there's a, there's a level of seriousness. You have a child on the way. Second th thing you mentioned a new level of seriousness and commitment. And right. I, I, are the, were those conscious? Was that a conscious thing? Or do you realize that when you look back now and say, this changed me, I, I you had something to be motivated for that you previously didn't have or someone's <laughs> I guess no, that, no, I think that's a good question. I mean, I know, I know what I had, you know, when I married my wife, I had a lot of, um, how do you put this? Um, it was, um, um, anarchy, you know, it's like you lose a parent, you have no direction here. It's like, and she was just, she had it together. I mean, she bought a house in college, right? Like she, while she was going to college, working full time, it's like, well, this person has Tracy, she's got her her act together. And I really admired her as much as I loved her, you know, in a real sense. I was like, Oh yeah. So I think it, it, it certainly helped me. Um, the, 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 you know, the birth of the child is just, you know, anybody who's been there, they know. And fathers, it's really different. You know, I mean, I, I, I jokingly said, because my wife did stay home with the kid, I would come home the first three or four years. And the minute I walked through the door, the kids were angry. It's like, who is this intruder? And this is a horrible joke, but I've shared it with friends and family, which is I walk through the door and say, okay, Oedipus, take it easy. And, <laughs> but I understand that that exists, right? Like kids like, and, and, but then I started becoming cool at about four or five years old with them. It was like, oh, this is a pretty cool dude. Like he's pretty funny and he likes to have fun. And, um, and I, my wife's like, golly, they don't want to be around me anymore. I said, don't worry. When they win the Super Bowl, they'll say, thanks, mom. They will never say thanks, Dad. <laughs> Dad. So I've had an appreciation for what that means, right? Like, I will say that that was one thing when it occurred, it felt, I mean, it felt chemical to me. Like, chemical so much that when they, you hear that first scream, that cry from your child, it's like, and first off, it's blood curdling. But number two, it was like real, <laughs> a, a real, I mean, organic change. And it was like, oh, and, and, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't terrifying. That was the amazing thing to me. It was like, oh, now it's, you know, almost, I, you know, I, I vision it in my head, like being knighted, you know, like, okay, now you're a knight. Yeah, you better get after it. I remember the moment. I mean, other than, you know, when I first saw my daughter, I was like, man, she's, it's not what I thought she'd look like. I don't know what I expected, but, but that was my first thought. My second thought, <laughs> half a second later was, uh, I, I, this is, this is by responsibility and, oh. and it's a responsibility to a level I, like you said, chemical, I think it's a great way to put it. I've never used that phrase or thought of it that way, but I think that's appropriate because it, it was life changing. It was altering, right? <laughs> Where you've said, I, this is my number one priority and everything else is such a distant second. It's not even on the list. Right. Right. To take care of this life. Like, that that's I right. And, and, and it to provide for in every way, shape or form. And it's like, and so that was a real visceral moment and it, informed and I'll, and I'll tell you it made any like effort or pain or suffering or challenges like bearable yeah right? well i mean because they're so insignificant you're insignificant at that point 
Yes. Right. Like, and you yes. know that, like as a father, you, you, you know, during that infant period where the mother is so critical, right? Yes. I mean, in, in addition to the nine months prior, <laughs> where you're in a, you're right. a bystander. Right. And I even would feel guilty because people would say things like, wait till you feel, you know, you see the um, sonogram and you see a baby in there. And I was like, yeah, it's cool. You know? And, and like Jen was super emotional. Everything was so meaningful to her. And then like, wait till you feel the baby kick. And I was like, cool. But I was disconnected from it. Right. Like it wasn't in me. Yes. And then, you know, seeing the baby move and all of those things. And, and even when she was born and I've told other, you know, expectant fathers this, yep. and maybe this is, is, is an indictment of myself. I don't know, but I'd say even when she was born, even though I felt that, it, it, and, and instantly it was like, I will kill for her. Yes. <laughs> will, right. You know, right. So it, it, it won't, it's not even a, a thought, but I think it was that moment of eye contact the first time yeah. where she recognized me. And that was just a whole new level. Right. Like, so it wasn't just a one time thing, but I almost felt guilty, um, during, um, you know, when, when Jen was pregnant with her, because I'm like, I don't feel I, everything I thought I'm just going <laughs> keep telling you, I'm going to feel what the hell. Until I did. And then it was like, oh, my God, life's never going to be the same. Yeah, it, it, it is. I, I, I think that's a, a problem that most, you know, women, wives struggle with is that, I mean, it, it truly is kind of an apathetic event for us up until that moment. It's like you can't even begin to understand this idea that something's growing inside of you. Like, how are you not freaking out every night? Like, I, <laughs> not so, night. so, so you have to kind of distance yourself. Although I did gain some sympathy weight. I did like all that ice cream at night, but I was like, you know, I, I, you literally can't understand and we will never understand. Like that's the, and that's fine. But that idea of, of removing yourself kind of even from your own life to a certain extent and going, okay, there's that, you know, the French put better raison d'etre. That's, that's my reason to be from here on out is a, is a really profound moment. And, and it, it's, um, yeah. So those, those events, I, I, I was conscious of it. I would say I was more conscious of it physically. I think in time and 20 years of reflection, I can reflect on it a little bit better of how profound that impact was. Um, but I, I, I'm a big fan of archetypes. I'm a big fan of hero journeys and all these things. And, you know, there's a famous book by Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. And sure. we all live that. Right. And so, and, and one of the things that, that, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's even sad, but you let's get back to your kid comment. Like, how do you impart this? Is like I'm constantly talking to my kids. Like, your your jury journey is heroic. You just don't know it yet, right? Like you're you're in the first couple of chapters, but it is going to be heroic, right? And I pray that you're not, you know, stuck uh, uh, in a very difficult spot like Ulysses. But we all do it, and there's those moments when we weep. And we pain and we hurt like we've never been hurt before. And then there's moments of triumph and, and so forth that, you know, are subtle. And anyway, Jesus. Well, that's what I mean. That, that, you know, the, the pain is inevitable. And we have to acknowledge that, right? Strife, yes. challenges, difficulty, adversity, all those things are inevitable to what degree? Yeah, they, they differ. But there's you know, reason to be optimistic and looking forward and overcome because that is where the feeling of reward. If you, as I said earlier, I don't believe you can feel rewarded without difficulty, right? Without a challenge. And, um, it happens. So, all right, do we have, how much time do we have five more minutes? Yeah, we got five more minutes. Okay. Cause we're, I'm going to go, I'm going to go lightning with you. Cause I want to get this. Hey, let's uh, go lightning. We, th yes, go ahead. You, you, you have the opportunity to be a you know, bank president. Yes. What traits, when you look at that, why do you think it was you instead of someone else? What did, what, what did you do to deserve that? Um, I think, you know, I, 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 and it, you know, we could tell a whole story on that, on that story. Um, but I would say that the biggest thing was that um, I was able to do two things. Years ago, I took a, a test and it said I should either be an air traffic controller or a bank president. Seriously. Oh, so it was an aptitude test. And I think there's similarities to that, right? So, so one of the things that's cool about what we do is we're the cheapest form of capital. 
So when, when you come to any bank and you go to borrow money, if you, if you watch Shark Tank, all you got to do is realize that. I want 20% on this loan for two years and I want 28% of your company. Like that's an expensive loan. Like yeah. that's a really expensive loan. Well, we don't do that. We've, we, we're very, very competitive. So I think the, the ability to, um, to make quick um, statistical analysis. So that's one component of it. But the other component is the people component of it. You know, um, money is, is nothing more than a representation of your time. And so when you consider the fact that we are dealing with people's money and we are either protecting it by making smart decisions, or we're giving people more money for them to live out their dreams and take the kind of risk you talk about. Um, that's a very, very visceral interpersonal situation. So if, if, if I had to say um, why I got the job, I can tell you specifically, I had a vision for what I wanted to do. So that was the first thing. And I think that only would have come with the experiences I've had. Um, I have a vision for what it is. I have an appreciation for the people necessary to do it, because if you want to travel fast, travel alone. If you want to travel far, travel together. And so I had an appreciation for people, and I'm not afraid of my um, my ego taking a backseat in all of it. Right? Like it's, what, when we accomplish what we're already accomplishing, it's not my doing; it's our team's doing. So I would say that vision. Um, uh, understanding what we need from our team and then putting the ego in the backseat. And, and I know you mean that because those are, those are things you've said to me offline because right? I've you yeah. know, been, been interested. I'm always interested in when, when my friends are successful. I remember when we hadn't talked for a while and you, you know, a few months and after, of course we've reconnected and, and you told me about, you know, Hey, I've been a little busy. Here's what happened. Yeah. And you brought me up to speed and, and, um, it was just very clear from really the time we reconnected because you were already um, you know, working for um, First United that you... Oh, I want to tell this story. But, you, but the, you were genuinely... Um, I, look, passionate's overused, right? I mean, that's for you to say. I, I don't know that you're passionate. But you were you you, you, you respected the organization. You found value yes. in the organization. Yeah. You it, it was personal. Maybe that's the word, right? Maybe that's passion. Maybe, maybe, that, was, maybe that is passion. I'll, I'll give you an example. And this is really, I, I told the story the other day, but um, in fact, I told it to my whole team, which was I had a peer who, from an experience standpoint, very similar to who I was, same institution, everything. And I was asked when a previous leader had left, I was asked by that person's boss, hey, can you help me out? And, um, and I said, absolutely, be happy to. And, and this person is a pretty amazing person, the person who asked me that. And, um, but I spoke to this peer of mine and they go, hey, are you, what, are you getting paid more? Like, hey, did you, um, are they giving you anything for that? And I went, no, uh, no, not at all. And they said, well, that's just not right. And I said, and I thought, well, okay, that's why you're where you're at. Like, like, <laughs> Like the worst case scenario, I've done a real solid, right? I've done a, a good turn, a favor for a person that I respect who has asked for my help, right? The other side is, hey, I may get this opportunity that has been intriguing me for a while. And that's exactly what happened. So I told you about vision and, 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 and understanding what people we need. But at the end of the day, really, the, I think the big reason I got the job is because I volunteered to do the job before I had it. But that's that's a very important message that you did the right thing, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, right. you, you did what you know the decent, good, wholesome, and that those are all the words that I think of as you've talked about you know the, your organization uh, yes. and, and just in our conversations. It's like you know, it's not about metrics and numbers and 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 all these things it's like hey let, let's be let, let's kind of be the best we can be at this let's let's treat our others the way we want to be treated let's be yeah. decent good people i mean which shouldn't be outstanding you know it shouldn't even it should be expected but i think that's rare uh, and now i mean the way you've talked about your organization is the way i would want anyone to talk about mine which is hey we we just do what's right in the moment Right. And, and we do it for the right reasons. And, um, you know, we, we care about the people we work with and we 
enjoy, right. you know, the interactions along the way. I mean, that like, what else can you ask for? And, it, and it's really, I had a situation where, and this is just a small example. I had an employee whose mom died and, and uh, going to be out for a little bit longer than we had hoped. Week, right? But he had a lot of stuff. This happened on a Sunday. So the whole week is shot. The funeral's on Friday. New employee, okay? So not really built up any sick leave. Not And and I love the fact that I work for a company that says, no, you take care of what you need to take care of, right? right. Like, didn't have to think about it. There's no email chain that needs to go anywhere. So I love the fact that we're living out that those values. And my, my bank does. Um, our institution is based on that. Um, it's based on personal growth. It's based on meeting people where they're at, which helped frame so much of of how I interact with people, right? And so, um, but yeah, I, I I think I think we're becoming more aware of that. And I, and I I will say this again, talking back, go back to millennials and wanting to work for a purpose driven company, and and those are really really important things to them. And I think it's one of the ways that when I look at our company and I look at other institutions that as long as we keep operating in alignment with those purpose and values, we'll be fine. Like everything else will take care of itself. Yeah, it's, um, it, it, as you're talking, I, I keep thinking, we're describing and, and talking about your organization and, and what makes it successful or not, right? Not, yes. you know, not operating based on fear. Um, Looking right. ahead, looking to do the right thing, not avoid doing the wrong thing, where so many companies do. When I worked for big companies, um, that was probably the most frustrating thing is that like everything was, mot no one was willing to make a decision. It was just, it was fear. It was un you know, like, let's not do that. If we, if we try something new, we like, no one gets in trouble. No one gets fired for doing the thing the way we've always done it. Right. You only get fired when you step out of line, but That's progress, right. innovation, you know, <laughs> change and evolution, none of those things happen unless you're willing to take chances. But as we're describing your organization, it's the same way we were describing like human success in life and the way you should have, right. which I, I, I've never thought about it before, but it's worthy of exploration. <laughs> Not now because we don't have time, but to, to say how, is it one and the same, right? Is what makes an organization successful kind of the same traits that make a, an individual successful? Yes. Hold on, Pete. I'm having a little bit of, can you hear me now? I can. Shoot. That was a profound. Okay, moment, good. Glenn, to, to be, for, now we lose. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> we just lost. Volume. Right. Well, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, right. Is is um, I presented this to my entire team um, uh, a week ago, and I'm talking to my entire team. Which is, do you have a growth or a fixed mindset? Yep. And that's it. And you can uh, just do yourself a favor, individuals who are watching this, go out and YouTube growth or fixed mindset, and and a growth mindset in companies encompass, encompasses everything you just discussed. Are we taking? Uh, are we making mistakes? Are we are we creating a safe environment in which mistakes can be made? Um, can we learn from those mistakes, right? Because the other thing is, is you know, if you can't learn, then we really shouldn't be trying to make mistakes. But, but you, so that goes to a learner versus a knower kind of viewpoint and so forth. But I absolutely believe that there, that the organization of a group of individuals, let's say a small group, and the individual, that process is the same, yep. right? So you mentioned something earlier, living with this guilt. That moment in your shower when you're thinking about that time you made an idiot out of yourself or you said the wrong thing in a meeting and you carry that stuff with you, that's an internal dialogue that takes place that prohibits your further growth because you've not let that go. For my personal faith, there is a, there is a very specific act of sacrifice which allows me to move forward understanding that those things are forgiven, right? So that's for me personally. The same is true within an organization. If you have that one voice, an individual, who's constantly reminding you about that time you screwed up, you're in, it's the same dynamic. Mm. It prevents any further step out, out on the plank, out on the beach, out on, you know, whatever. And, um, and I think they're paramount to, to success. So uh, true. It, Man, I love that. That's great. That is, that is great. I, I want to, we could end there, but I have to just ask you, I want to talk about this group thing. I mean, it, and I do, and I want to talk about scouts, but just real quick, this 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 small group that you mentioned, I, it keeps popping up in my head as as we're talking, 
I've never thought, is that a new thought for you that, that most of your life centers around different, you know, small groups of what, six to 10, I think you said, is that, so, is that a so new thought? Is that an original? That, it, yeah. um, no, I just, I think, um, I, I, you know, I've, I've taken Wood Badge, which is a highest form of leadership training and scouting, right? And we talk about the nature of small groups. The, the, if you look at the military, right, you have a patrol that's made up of these six to 10 individuals. And I forget, I'm not a military person, so forgive me, but those patrols make up a platoon and, and so forth. Um, this is how we're going to interact. And frankly, if you look at any organizational book, um, Rockefeller habits, scaling up, all these various things, it talks about what a manageable group of individuals is, right? So, so having six to 10 reports is the right thing. And then when I look at, oh, wait a minute, I'm in a scout troop and the troop is made up of multiple patrols and the patrols are made up of six to 10 people. And it's just everything I've noticed. And one of the things that I was, I became obsessed with it and I've actually changed my organizational management within my organization. Rick Warren, who does the Purpose Driven Life, um, if you're familiar with that individual, I actually just talked about this with my team this morning is that um, I was running a meeting where I had like 25 individuals, in it, right? So I'm given kind of an update and I'm asking for engagement. There's 25 people. Good luck. And, Good luck. and 25 people. Feedback. Yeah, right. And there's like six to eight in this meeting. And then there's another group of six to eight. And it's like, this is a train wreck. And I literally <laughs> sat there. I was like, Whew. so I started thinking about like, how is this? Well, um, he, he quotes six good reasons for having a small group. And that's how we, we develop, right? So number one is the best place to develop real camaraderie and teamwork. Right. So you really get an opportunity to well, look at what the uh, football team's got 11. Right. Baseball team's got nine on a side. Basketball team's got five. I don't think there's any mistake that those numbers exist. Right. So the best place to develop real teamwork and camaraderie. It helps everyone to apply their skills and talents and contribute by being more comfortable to ask questions. When we you know, we, we have big meetings and there's 30 or 40 people in there what's the hardest thing to get anybody to do? Ask a question. And right. any, any leader of that, that uh, organization will stand up in front of 40 or 50 people and they're begging for questions. Well, that's the dynamic. Uh, number three, it provides accountability for each of us to, uh, that we need to grow, right? So I can't call out an individual in my group when there's 30 people on the phone and say, hey, last week you told me you were gonna do X, Y, Z. <laughs> Right. Now it's like, but if I'm sitting around a conference table with six people, these people you work through, it's just like a family, right? There's a lot of people that have six, 10 members of their family. Like this is a real place that we're going to talk about real things and real commitment. So that was one. Um, number four, it offers support to its members when you're under stress. I cannot know that one of my lenders lost his mother in a meeting where there's 30 people in there. Mm. There's no way to appropriately even address that, inquire about it, so forth, right? Number five, it's a safe place to develop one's talents and skills, which leads to the, what we talked about before, growth or, or a fixed mindset, like, hey, I'm going to make mistakes and people are going to forgive me. And then six is it is a naturally relaxed place to share our concerns, fears, and obstacles. So those all came from Rick Warren, but it, it became apparent to me as I look at our organization and trying to become a matrix organization and, you know, you look at, uh, you know, kind of guerrilla warfare, I hate to say that, but, you know, that idea of these small groups moving together, huge amounts of trust and faith in one another, real interpersonal care for one another, um, the ability to be goofy, silly, kind of outside of your normal comfort zone, because that's where our growth is. Um, that it, it has been kind of an obsession. It's funny you should bring that up. I'm glad you picked up on it because I don't think we've ever talked about it. No, and I've never heard anyone else mention it the way you did. And so much so that I'm thinking, man, you need, you need to figure out how to write a book about it. Because I'm, if it's something I'm, that's I'm shaping thinking. your whole mentality and the way you're, you know, um, attaining success and, and going about, you know, managing your, your organization, um, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be unpacked there. That I, yes. That, that I think it's, I think it's real. Yep. Um, so look, I, I'm not going to keep asking you questions because I want to talk. You can, you can, we've got time. We've got do we time. Have, do we have time? We do. Okay. So 
let's talk about scouting because it's it's something yeah. that I um, we all know about, right? But unless you've been part of it, you don't really, really know, um, you know, what what you get out of it. And you know, you've you've been involved with your sons. Were you were you in scouts as a kid? No. So so I mean, it's funny. You know, I grew up in Largo, Florida, Bel Air Beach, Florida. I mean, I, the only time I ever spent the night outside was on a beach on a blanket. Like there was tenting, there was no hiking. We would play maybe, maybe at the Sheridan Sand Key. That's <laughs> about the extent of it, right? So. <laughs> So there was, that was not my thing. And I told you before, my dad was 67, 65 when I was 18. So it wasn't like we were, Hey, we went out and, um, you know, my kid was third grade and he comes up to me and he says, Hey, I want to, I want to join the scouts. And I was like, all right, you know, and, and like I said, we were older parents. So you get, you're, you're unsure, you know, all the books you read about is a kid developing correct. And, but being in those groups, you know, coaching and then scouting, I began to realize like all these kids are weird. Like they're just, and I love the fact that they're weird and goofy and all the rest of it, but it allowed me to interact with other adults and, and really understand what that program is about, which is personal achievement. Um, it's not, uh, uh, w w my son who is an Eagle Scout is also a college football player. Um, uh, so he was able to do that within that parameter, but it provided a real. Which is um, really rare. How, how many, how many. I mean, I don't know, know this. Not number, many, not many. Very few. There's very few Eagle Scouts, right? Relatively right. very few kids you know, get to play, you know, college athletics. Um, and, and the com, com I mean, it's got to be a handful. A it's it, it's handful. not a lot. And so we. That's, like, that's a big deal. <laughs> it, it is kind of a big deal. And it's not, you know, it, I, one of the saddest things I have is it, in terms of, as you know, as kids get older, they don't want to wear their uniform, you know, and I get that. I mean, I, you know, I understand there's social pressures and so forth, but for me and being in the heartland of America, like it's great to be a part of a patriotic organization. And it certainly is who teaches respect for their community, their nation, their flag, frankly, even the whole world. Um, it teaches real practical skills, you know, so there's a, there's a set of requirements that are needed for scouts to advance in rank. There's seven ranks to get to Eagle, but along that way, you have to have fields of study, which could be sports. It could be robotics. It could be bugling. It could be American business where you put some extra effort into a, a field of study. I, I teach personal management to a lot of kids. And I love that because it teaches them about checking accounts and managing a schedule and doing all these various things. Um, but I was just drawn to the program really for the leadership elements of it. And frankly, the results, like I'm a big believer of like, okay, if, and, and I can spot an Eagle Scout, if I'm in a Best Buy or I'm at wherever I can spot them, you know, if they're under 25 and they, you can just spot them, they look you straight in the eye, they give you that firm handshake, all those things that you really, really want. And, and so I was, I, I fell in love with the results of it. Secretly though, I, I love some of the physical elements of it. You know, I told you, we just took a, a group of 50 people off to New Mexico and we camped at 9,000 feet and yours truly was hiking all over the place. And, and it's environments, it's exposed me to environments that I would not normally be, but most importantly, and I think the main reason I got involved and got so involved. And I think this is, it's just, I get my kids for 40 hours a month uninterrupted Yeah, that's without, awesome. without cell phones, without like, so we leave Friday night at, at 6 p.m. and then we come home sometime afternoon on Sunday, there's no cell phones. We're tying knots, we're telling stories, we're lighting campfires. And so for me, that was the first and foremost thing is just getting those time with my boys. Um, but then the secondary thing is, you know, I just, I wanted to get involved because I believe in the leadership development qualities of it. You know, we haven't even talked about all the other things, but when you have groups and how they, they form and they storm and then they perform, you know, like what's those processes. And, and I learned a lot of that um, uh, in that organization and just seeing that development of, of kids, mine, mine especially, but being able to see other kids is just remarkable. Um, and and I, I think many people get it in sports in the same way, but I don't think, and I'm not knocking sports, I got an athlete, um, but I think the character development piece is more pronounced in this, right? No. Yeah, I, I mean, I 
I think as, as I've gone, you know, through sports with my kids and it's changed. I think it used to be that. I don't think it is anymore. I think it's, you know, it's a lot of it. My perspective is very unhealthy right now. What's happening in sports between the club stuff, you know, the pay for play yes. deals with these club maniacal club coaches who tell their kids they can't play for their high school team or their middle, middle school team with the promise of, uh, you know, a scholarship that doesn't exist. You know, had some, I've had some friends over the years thinking right. they're, they're, child who was you know sacrificing nights and weekends and mornings and and fun social times and, and social um development yeah i'm um, thinking that there was a scholarship on the other end of the rainbow and very few apps, college athletes are on scholarship and people just That's don't right. realize that which is crazy wow. to me that you didn't bother to look um but i had a good friend whose daughter was a um a junior and maybe even the beginning of her senior year in in high school it was a swimmer. It was like, oh, I didn't realize they didn't get full scholarships for swimmers. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> yeah. And, and it was yeah, that's not a fun thing to realize. But um, and and you know, in, in sports, unfortunately, you know, there's a weird value that's placed on them with parents right now about wanting their kid to be a successful athlete, which I just find bizarre. And I guess it's different for me having gone through it and having had a son who. Um, did want to play in college and, yep. and did have and the did. opportunity yeah. to to to, yeah. um, to do that, um, and it's not the glamorous thing that people think it is, right? And you're, you know, no, it's a lot of hard work. And and, it, and, yeah, and it's disproportionate. We run into a lot of it here. It's just disproportionate. Like, I don't remember when I was growing up this many kids in organized athletics. There just wasn't as many. Like, as a percentage, if you were to take in our school, right? Like, how many people were performing or participating? But I know a ton of people that are like, and their kids are in it, and so but with um, with intensity, right? That's what oh, I yes. find bizarre. I mean, I had a dad <laughs> tell me I was asking about the the club, um, a club uh, lacrosse uh, yeah. group, and, and and he was like, "Oh, you have to join this club if you want your kid to, to play it." you know, the high school with, with, it was like a feeder team. Right. And I was like, he's in fifth grade. Right. <laughs> like, really? Like, doesn't, yes. doesn't the best one who shows up for tryouts make the team in high school and that, does it not work that way anymore? And it's just, I've witnessed it. I'm sure you have too. Uh, there's some weird stuff. Yeah. And I don't yes. know that it's the bastion of character building that, that it used to be. Well, and I think there are moments of that, you know, I think, I think sports do deliver probably humility a little bit, better for sure and, that yep. um and that's always a good quality to have um and i and you know it, it it certainly feeds into the zeitgeist of of you know remember the titans all these various things of like i love it you know the accomplishment of of um golly you know what i just thought of and i'm sitting here you're thinking about small groups i've had this theory for years which is the smaller the team the larger probability of an upset right because right. there are fewer parts contributing to the success of it. So there's another benefit of small groups. But, um, you know, the, it's it, it, our stories are filled with it, right? I mean, half of Hollywood, it seems like, you know, we've got a bunch of these sport-related movies. Um, but again, it's the same hero's journey, right? Like, that can happen in scouting. That can happen in marathons if that's kind of your thing or that can happen in your volunteer life if you see a problem in your community and you want to overcome it and it's like all those stories are the same right overcoming obstacles and so forth well what's what's interesting is you as you're saying that i think is that um you know scouts are succeeding quietly right yes privately they're not succeeding you know for the admiration of someone else, for the attention of someone else. Right. Um, yeah, it was in a lot of the individual sports. I mean, had in hindsight, I, I played team sports growing up. And, um, but yeah. I, I look at the lessons my daughter learned as a swimmer um, that are, for the most part, you know, if I look, what did she have to learn? Well, she had to learn personal responsibility, accountability, yes. and you're, yes. you know, you, there's no one to make excuses with. And, you know, swimming in particular is something that you're, how good you are as a swimmer is not subjective, right? I mean, it's right. And there's nobody else helping you. Maybe in a relay, 
but it's you. It, there's no one playing politics, right? And, and all of that. I mean, not not unless the coach is a lunatic, but that right. you know, you are as good as, as the number says you are. And if you want to get better, it's going to be a matter of what you put into it for the most part. And That's I fun. loved watching that unfold um, where, you know, watching the team sports is – it's just gotten weird. I mean, we, we, we don't need to talk about that. But with scouting, I, I think these guys are doing it um, not because it's, you know, they get to wear the jersey to school on Friday or, or because there's a crowd on Friday night. They're, they're doing it to become – someone has encouraged them, whether it's self-driven or parents. They're, they're becoming better citizens, better people. I think that's – Well, a I'll, cool I'll give an example of that, which is directly related to both these things. So my son was a quarterback – and here's what happened. So a seventh grader goes out for quarterback, the coach laughs him off the field. Like he had never, he played peewee ball, but he had never touched the ball. He played as a lineman. Mm. But his mom was an old state pitcher and was a college softball pitcher. So that, that, wow. that genetics was there. And um, so he says, well, I'm going to go do this. And I'm like, oh my, this is going to be a train wreck. And it was. <laughs> And it was. And, and he, you know, he cried all the way home because the coach was like, no. Nope. No way. But he did let him stay on the team, right? And so they made him a cornerback, which was the most absurd thing. That's what he wanted to do, right? So uh, the following year, he uh, we, we find out. And I said, well, son, what, what do you think? And he goes, I don't know what I'm doing. And I said, well, okay, that's good. So we found a coach, and we took him to a private coach. And we're paying for these lessons. Well, it's eighth grade year, right? Last year of middle school, he's the JV quarterback. Okay, so he's not the starter. Freshman comes around. They got a freshman team because I, I don't even remember a freshman team. Maybe there was one when you No, nope, we, we didn't do it. <laughs> we didn't, no, have this. No. didn't understand that. No. I mean, that so like that, that in and of itself is a problem in our society, which is like, hey, you, you got to grind it out until it's your turn, right? I mean, that's right. part of the whole process. Well, anyway, he, he, he beat out the other kid and he was the freshman starting quarterback had a stud quarterback in front of him his sophomore year. And uh, when it came around to uh, his junior year, um, I said, hey, man, it's your turn, right? Like you put all your time in, blah, blah, blah. Well, we had a change of coaches. The coaches didn't see it that way. And um, and I and this at this point, this kid's like a life scout. He's almost like an Eagle Scout. And I listen, he comes from good parents, too. But I said, listen. I'll go rent. I mean, this is a true story. I'll go rent an apartment and we'll go to another school because the coach that coaches them says, Hey, you're an outstanding quarterback. It's too bad. You're not getting a safe. He never even got a chance with the first team offense. And it was like wow. pretty clear. And that frustrated me. And I took him in front of the coach and, and I said, Hey, don't you think he deserves 10 reps of practice? He's been here for three years, like two and a half years. Are, are, are you going to give him? Nope. That's never going to happen. Was the wow. exact. Wow. Oh, no kidding. And, and, but, but I went and, and two things occurred. Number one, the kid who he was battling against, he was like buddies with. And, mm. you know, me personally, it's like, hey, man, you, gotta, you can't show him anything. Yeah, that but, makes it <laughs> right. That makes right. It yeah. And, and, but here's my scout who says, Dad, you know, just because we're fighting for the same job doesn't mean I'm going to hate it. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a good perspective. That's admirable. Yep. That's very admirable. And then when this whole deal came up and I said, why don't we rent an apartment in another school district? You and I will spend all week there and we'll be home on the weekends, whatever. And he said, no, dad, I'm going to play with my team. And I thought, okay, like, all right, that's, we're heading in the right direction here. Right. In terms of his morals and what guides, him, sure. which is these kids that he's been playing with for three years, he doesn't want to leave them. Yes. What he individually wants is important, but it's not more important than the benefit of the group. And so I was really proud. And I don't think that would have come about without all the moral and, and character development that happened in scouts. That's my personal belief. So, yeah, I mean, I, it, that's, that is interesting. And that is, you know, that's very evolved for a young age, right? It, to, I was really, really proud of him. This is from the same kid that, um, and, and golly, Pete, we got it. I know um, <laughs> we need to have two parts now. Um, this is the same kid that when he tried out, he was in, you know, shorts and a, and a t-shirt and he went out to this, you know, skills camp or whatever. And he's like, dad, I want to play football. And we're sitting in the library and I said, well, Hey, well, that sounds great, man. Let's get you some pads. And he's like, pads. What do, what do we need pants for? I said, well, 
you know, it's tackle football. So I'm like, that was just for you guys to run around and the coaches to see how fast you run and maybe how quick you run sideways. Oh, no, 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 dad. I, I don't know about that. I mean, I could get hurt. <laughs> I said, son, no, that's, that's the point of the pads. You wear the pads so you don't get hurt. And he, and he was like, no, no, no. And, and I remember this was a real pivotal conversation he and I said, had, and I said, son, I, I'm telling you right now, like you are telling yourself a story of how this story is going to end. And I'm telling you right now, if you, if you approach the rest of your life on every position that this could end badly, your life is going to be the worst life I could ever imagine. Like right. you cannot approach everything with this idea of what the worst that could happen. I said, it, 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 you are going to miss so many experiences son. that, and you, and you'll become bitter and, and so forth. And, and so we had that real, and God, he was, he was the fourth grade. I think it was the fourth grade. So he must've been nine. And he sat there for a long time and we're in the office and he goes, we should go get those pads. I said, you're darn too. We should go really? Get really? So, yeah. You remember those, those moments. Yes. I, I yes. had one with uh, my oldest who, um, he was always the biggest kid in his class. And so, yeah, people would always say, oh, you're a football player. And it didn't even occur to me. And I played, you know, in all through high school. Yeah. And um, I, I just, you know, it was still little to me, you know, we were still doing like Y soccer or YMCA soccer and that sort of thing. And so finally a, a dad at school who was a head football coach of the, the program in our area and just a great guy, he grabbed him one night. He's like, all right, you're, you ready to play? And he's like, yes, sir, I'm ready to play. And I'm like, all right, we're playing football. So right. of course they immediately stick him on the line, you know, because he had played That's flag and all that. I'm like, dude, you're never touching a football again with your hands unless you play center, right? <laughs> and it was, you know, he goes out and these kids had this was fifth grade, and a lot of the kids had been with the program, you know, since you know for a couple of years. And and yeah. it's confusing to go out on a that a football. There's a lot of moving parts, as you know. Yeah. And his first day in pads. It, he was just super confused and didn't know, you know, up from down. And, and it, physically it wasn't a problem. He just was, it just, it just wasn't a fun day. And, and I remember sitting at the, at the bar, you know, by our kitchen and, and he, he just was like, I don't think I want to play. I don't know if, or he, I don't know maybe how he phrased it, but it was a pivotal moment where I was like, you have to decide. Like it's early enough, you know, you've got a taste of it. Right. It's on you. I'm not going to tell you you should play because I, that is not something that anyone should force you to do. I mean, we force our kids to do some things, but playing tackle football is not going to be one of them. That's for damn That's right. That's right. And I said, you need to figure it out, right? I said, but I can tell you this. You just, th this was your worst day. Yeah. Right? Every day is going to get better. And, <laughs> you know, and the other thing I'll tell you is if you quit now, you're always going to wonder. And I know you're young and all that. I mean, he was, just, he was in fifth grade, but I was like, I I'm going to tell you not to quit. I'm going to tell you, I don't think you should quit, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to force you to Required do something you. like that either yeah. at this point. Yeah. And, um, but you have to decide. And it was like this 30 minutes where just standoff where he, did, and he's like, I'm playing, I'll do it. And, and he never looked back despite, you know, all through high school, the multiple surgeries, awesome. you've, you've heard all that story. And I've yeah. talked about yeah. it here before. I won't do it now, but just, I mean, so much adversity, so much pain, so much suffering. And, um, he never wavered again. And, 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 right. you know, from that, and I've always thought, wow, okay. You know, that's, 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 that's interesting. so big, so much bigger than football. And, and, you know, I, it, I, when he earned his Eagle scout, um, that was, that was the one character trait. I, I really talked about what, what our kids teach us and, you know, you and I could do a whole separate podcast on just what our kids teach us. But I, I mean, I adore grit. I adore grit like there's just nothing like it i mean I, there's no other single quality so when you tell that story and it's like yeah all the injuries and never wavered it's like oh, it's just those those are the kind of people you want on every team you have the trivia team at, at the bar a person that you work by work with a person in your family those the non waivers are the best right yeah i mean it, it's 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 um i wouldn't have done it <laughs> oh, right. That's right. That's right. What if, um, I hated playing football at the end. By the time I was a senior in high school, I was like, get me out of here. This sucks. <laughs> I was like, it hurt. It's, you know, it's you're wearing a helmet in Florida and shoulder pads and the whole thing. I mean, it's oh, just in you know, a dirt practice field we had at Largo. It was awful. 95 and 95 and dirt. 
Exactly. That dirt didn't even brush off. It just turned into mud. So, <laughs> exactly. oh, dear Lord. Well, well, look, I do want to, if you, if you'll, if you'll agree, I will let you go today. If I would love to have, um, have you back on maybe in you know six months. I won't ask you sure. next week or anything, but I, you, you mentioned something I think is so important. And I think it would be so valuable and we're going to be addressing it on, um, through the site on Zengig is financial um, knowledge and management for young, um, not just young people, quite frankly, you know, we realize as I'm sure you know better, much better than I do, even people our age are not equipped um, to, with financial knowledge. And so since Zengig is going to serve uh, people throughout their career from students all the way through people, you know, close to retirement, we'd be remiss to not address financial education and put some resources on there. So if you, if you would be willing, I'd love to have you come back and just share, you know, let's talk about what young people need to know. Yep. Um, we won't try to solve all the world's problems, but, um, you know, the older folks, that's a, that's a much deeper conversation. No, we'll, uh, no without a doubt. And I, we, we as a company are devoted to that. I personally am devoted to that. It, it's, it really is, again, when you think about the fact that what you were getting paid is for your time, which is your life, and how little respect we give to the education of how to treat your life that is accumulated. And that's, and it's not, and I don't mean like money, you worship money or anything, but your time is what you gave up to get this sum of money and how are you allocating it from a budgetary standpoint or an investment standpoint or all those things is really paramount because again, it's your life. It's a representation of your life. Yeah, and and money's not the precious asset, right? Time is. That's right. And, and and you know, as we've learned, you can print more money, but you can't make more time. And no. um, it, it's so true. And it's it's the education system. We won't go into this now. We'll talk more about it. When we go come back on is is not what anyone would, would design if they were starting today, right? And and it's it's inherently flawed. I'm 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 not someone who believes that most that at co not everyone needs to go to college. I'll just say that. Not, well, of course. And, you know, and all you have to do is look at the economics of it. This is not a, a, Oh, well, you know, you, you are not smart enough. I, I met people who, again, I would say had to struggle more difficult to get really good grades and are excellent professionals in their chosen profession. Um, but the the reality is the economics of where you're, of where we're at, and golly, I'm talking to someone about this right now, actually, for from a university, which is these micro degrees or micro skill set understanding. Because I I I have a pretty good idea what I need my people to understand, um, and 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 it's not as involved as a four year degree. It really, truly isn't. And I'll tell you, a huge part of that, I would give, like, this is something I did one course on. It was a, a leadership development course in college, which was great. But I, I would highly recommend that, that students take 8 to 12 hours of interpersonal communication, um, challenging, like, uh, like goal setting, committed actions, like all these things, because that's how we're going to about, you know, we're going to look at you and how you interact, but the, it is truly sad to me that everybody is going to get paid. Almost everybody. I shouldn't say that it shouldn't be glib, but almost everybody's going to be paid for some service skill, whatever you may have. And we just don't have enough people to understand how to handle that. So happy to help in that regard. Yeah, let's do that. I think that would be really valuable. And if the bank is, is putting out um, information that we can promote yes. um, as well, I'd yep. love to do that too. So, um, so Clinton, thank you. I, I, you know, you've been so generous with your time. I, I think <laughs> we could keep going all night. We um, could. You, you're a busy, you're a busy, busy guy. And so I, I genuinely appreciate um, everything you shared today. There's a lot, um, a lot of great lessons um, to be taken away. So um, man, I just, just thank you. Hey, I'm flattered. And I'm, you know, just, we've had a lot of conversations over the last couple of years, reconnecting two, three years, but even beyond that, I really enjoyed this Pete. So I, I, I went and talked to a, a group of recruits, um, uh, college age kids who were looking for jobs and so forth. And, and I just think about this as a resource. And I meant what I said earlier, which is to be able to understand that, you know, and God, you know, think about how many kids who are, who are just, 
recently graduated and they're like, I'm not in the job I want. And they think that's it. Right. Like they're on the path. So the, the more people that you have that kind of explain that it's a zigzaggy journey and that it takes, you know, turns and so forth, the better for our society. And I, you know, again, I don't see anybody doing this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored yeah. to have been on here and thank you for doing it. Well, we'll, uh, we'll keep doing it together then. So All right, man. Uh, we'll leave it at that. So thank you for listening and drive safe. We'd love if you could, uh, if you've gotten this far, then, you know, please, please rate, uh, and subscribe to the show. We would love that. And, um, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Glenn, thanks again. Hey, thanks. Take care, Pete.